All right, thank you. So I've got a lot of stuff I want to go through. Before I get rolling, um, I'm, from a, I'm from way down south, and I'll show you exactly where I'm from. A lot of the stuff, and the first thing when I talk to people about some of the stuff I do, they get all bent out of shape that, well, you could do that down where you are. We can't do any of that up here. So what I'm going to challenge you with is listen, listen to some of the things I do, follow the journey that I made to get where I am today, and see if there's something in there that you can use on your own farm, your own, uh, your own operations at home, some little idea that'll work, either an alternative feed or a labor-saving idea or something, see if you can pick out something that'll work. So I'll, I'll give you my story. So we run the Buis Beef Ranch. We're just outside of Chatham. Um, we're, we have four generations on the farm. Um, basically, we run 300 cows. We run with uh, two full-time, uh, some part-time, some seasonal, working about 750 acres. That includes cash crops of corn, sweet seed corn, and commercial corn, soybeans, seed soybeans, wheat, barley, and pasture. We run about 225 spring calving cows, 75 fall calvers. We background and finish all our cattle, and uh, we grow some replacements. Just because we don't have nearly enough to do, we have on-farm retail. My wife Joanne runs the retail. We sell our own farm-raised beef. We'll put about 100, 100 cattle through our, uh, our retail operation. So our challenge, when we got into the cattle business in 2004, we, had, we always ran feedlot, and we had never run uh, cows before. In 2004, we thought it was a good idea to start raising some cows. So we bought in 100 cows and, and decided we were going to be in the cow business. Our challenge was we had this big cow herd. We had a retail outlet. We had some very expensive land. And land our way, if somebody offers me 22 to 25,000 an acre, I probably won't take it because that may or may not be enough for the piece they're looking at. Uh, we've got some high value cropping choices, so we can grow a lot of anything. Um, staff is difficult to find, people to work on the farm, as you know. How do we make that work in the middle of our cash cropping? So, because I travel a bit into the US, I put this map up here to show people exactly where we come from because we were in, uh, we were in uh, North Dakota a while ago and people are saying, oh, you're from Canada, you're way up north, and we're actually quite a bit south of there. Um, we were in Nebraska too for a bit, and uh, so they get an idea of where we are. So that's where we're located. Southwestern Ontario, everybody from up here tells me this is where we are, down in the banana belt, of course, and that's what our, our farms look like, right? No, most of the time they look like this, just, just like you guys were cold and snowy in there. So we were looking at traditional systems of raising cattle when we started. This is where we started, calving in the barn. Um, needed some permanent pasture outside to run these girls in the summertime. This is what, this is what our model was coming in. We needed 100 to 150 days of grazing. We needed some permanent pasture. We could get about two acres per animal. We needed about 200 days of stored feed, and uh, we're gonna calve indoors. Well, tradition's nice, but this is where we'd like to calve. So, unfortunately, this is what our ground looks like. So there's tomatoes, some sweet corn being harvested. So, we have pasture land or we have crop land, so here's what we can grow, or can we raise beef like that in our area? So you see this picture here? Here's some cows running out on the stalk stalks. Why not? So I'll show you this picture here. Anybody want to venture a guess the date that this picture's taken, even the month? This is December 20th. So that's the growth after a crop of sweet corn. Here's some rye that that cow's on. On both sides is, uh, is oats on either side. So here we are in January grazing out on some sweet corn stubble. Here's after our commercial corn harvest. This is what we've got in there. So what have I learned to get to that point? Make one new mistake every year. The key word is one <laughs> and new. So we try to do only make one new mistake. If we're not making at least one mistake a year, we're not trying hard enough and trying enough different things. So the, the guys at the coffee shop always have lots of fodder to discuss because they drive by my place on the way to the coffee shop just to see what I'm doing. So I'll, I'll give you the journey how we got to where we are today. 
we started out with just oats and wheat stubble. Harvest the wheat, drill in some oats, and uh, kick the cows out. That worked out really nice at first, nice and simple, easy to do. Unfortunately, you get to a point and the cows are saying, now what? It's all gone, nothing to eat. So we started looking around at other options we had. So we had some alfalfa that uh, we've taken three cuts off. There's the fourth cut sitting there. You don't want to do it because you're going to kill it in the winter. So we leave that sit there. We've got lots of this sitting there, lots and lots of corn stalks. And after, after corn silage or after other crops, we had uh, some rye or whatever we could have seeded down. Got my very enthusiastic fence crew out there in January fencing. And uh, I was just ta talking to a few folks this morning. I've got, we just acquired a, a neighbor's farm, 100 acres of corn stalks that we're going to graze, custom graze this, this winter yet. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any fence on there yet. So we will, in the next few weeks, be punching some holes and stringing some fence. Um, this works really well for, uh, for grazing. There's lots of feed there. We can run a fair number of cows out on just plain corn stalks. Uh, but the question is, is this as good as it gets? So rule of thumb is one acre corn stalks will do one cow for one month, um, depending on your corn stalk yield and, and conditions, etc. But that's nice free feed just sitting there. I throw this up not as an exact amount of what forages you can expect, but where my mind is at, where we need to kind of look at what's available, what can we grow when, and what can we use as a... Uh, as pasture if we're going to start growing some of this stuff. And also kind of give you an idea of what sort of dry matter you can expect. Um, you'll see the sorghum in there and I'll show you some pictures in a bit of what, we, what we're doing now with sorghum. So just an idea that we've got tons of dry matter sitting just out on the field, just with the corn stalks. You can, act, you can figure about 12 tons sitting out there. So here's uh, oats after sweet corn, after sweet corn harvest. Um, coming out to head, maybe not a good amount of fall growth. Our challenge was, this is good for the fall, but we need something that's going to get us into the spring. Because we want to run these cows right through until spring. So, yes, there's heads there, there's no grain in there. Um, we can graze that quite successfully. So after corn silage, depending on how much time we have, we'll get a little bit of growth like that on there. They will go through, they'll pick out every one of the ears you left behind which is one of the challenges when you're doing corn stalks. Those girls will walk up and down every single row and find every ear of corn you miss with a combine. They'll find every little pile of grain that you spilled filling the wagons or the, or the semi. And uh, you just have to pay attention to those that we don't get any uh, grain overload because they will find those spots and go right to them. Um, we've tried a few different things. So this is after snap beans. This is actually spinach planted into there. We were dabbling, dibbling, dabbling with a bunch of different things. We decided we needed to really take a serious look, figure out what's going to work um, in our system because it has to work with our cropping system and it has to be make some decent feed. So we put, it, we put together a trial. We took a 50-acre chunk after uh, snap beans and we put uh, in a bunch of different things. So you see peas, oats, there's some sweet corn in there. That's kind of what those peas look like just ahead of grazing. Spinach in there, um, rye grass and clover and spinach, snap beans, a little bit of clo red clover, some oats, cross fenced it, kicked the cows out, let's see what will happen. So at the end of the day, they kind of went along and you can see it's, it's cross fenced across all the strips. They grazed pretty well everything and that's what you got left there. They grazed that right down to nothing. So at the end of the day, long story short, didn't really matter what we, were, what we planted. If it was green, they ate it. So we need to start it to look at what we can get in, in the way of volume. So some of the stuff worked better than others. So we started dabbling with a few different things. And that was good for the fall, but what about the winter? So the sweet corn going into the winter. So this is discard seed that we had seeded down. And that's what that looked like coming into the winter. How are we going to get forages when our field looked like this? What are we going to do for feed? How are we going to make this work? So opportunities don't just happen, we needed to create them. So we started looking at a bunch of different opportunities where we can make this fit. We needed a plan. So we had this, this kind of set up and here's where we were at the time. We had some uh, rye, we had some alfalfa, we had some, some sweet corn or some uh, oats in our corn silage ground. We had oats and rye after snap beans and we had some rye seeded after some tomatoes. So, there's kind of the way that those fields were set up. 
And this is what they looked like coming into the, uh, into the grazing season. So here's January, that's what that alfalfa looked like going into January. Um, we had a bit of a thaw, so it looked good in the part of the year. Um, some rye in there, oats and rye in January, oats in March, and oat, that's another shot of that oats in March. March rye pasture, kind of looking like that. So we cross-fenced that, we, we kept the cows in certain areas for a number of days, and here's how our schedule worked. So we kicked them out on the 8th of January, they were in that field for a few days, for about 20 days, and you could follow the schedule down. So basically, this group was 160 cows on 145 acres. We went from the 8th of January till the end of March. No extra feed added. And I have to be really careful when I say we didn't feed our cows for this time because the, uh, the animal rights people get a little upset when you say you haven't fed them. We didn't add any extra feed. We had enough. So this will depend, and I'll throw a caveat in there, this depends on the winter. Um, right now we're seeing minus 13 to minus 18, just like you guys down there. We are adding some extra feed to those girls out there. They need a little bit extra energy when it's that cold. Um, if we have a decent winter, we don't need to add a lot. This particular winter, we had 82 days. Before we kicked them out, we were feeding about seven tons of silage. So here's what, what our cover crop returned per acre. So $99 an acre is what I calculated was our return just in feed savings. We didn't have to harvest it, we didn't have to store it, we didn't have to worry about manure. We also had the plus that we we're improving some organic matter, we're protecting us from wind and water erosion which is difficult on our sandy ground. We had the roots and we're improving our water holding capacity. So we have great growth on top, so there's a turnip, you can see it's about a foot high. Um, some barley there, 32 inches, going into the fall. Cover crops are just above the ground. We're also getting the benefit of these roots down below. So you can see, you can see that root structure in there, that rye. That's only planted after, after another crop, right? So this is only a short time it's been in the ground, and we're, we're creating this wonderful root mass right there. Challenges? Oh, yeah. So I have not failed. I found 10,000 ways that won't work. So we needed to find a crop that's going to work. So the spinach was okay, um, not so much in the, in the spring. Tomatoes, well, if they're left over, you've got to do something with them. The cows will go through and pick at them. There's not really a lot of feed value. This is working really good. So this is uh, seeded into standing corn. Um, we, we do a few different things. So this is broadcast after sweet corn. So just throw it in a fertilizer spreader, drive down the field after the sweet corn's off, and let it happen. We don't touch it. We don't want to stir those stalks in. Uh, the cows are going to eat the stalks too, so we leave everything on top. No-till drill, if we're getting close in the fall where we need some better soil to, soil to seed contact, we will no-till drill some stuff in just to get it going a little bit quicker. So we've done that as well. This was our experiment a couple years ago, and it's working out really, really well. So this machine is an old haggy with an air seeder on it. We're into the commercial corn. Um, this particular year, we were a little bit late planting it, so we'd like to see it um, when the corn's about that four to five leaf stage when we're going to drop it in. So just after our weed-free zone, our, weed, our critical weed-free time, is when we want to drop that into the commercial corn. Um, just drop the seed in on top and let it happen. And it'll sit there kind of dormant and not do a whole lot until, uh, until the leaves start to come down on the, commercial, on the corn and it gets some sunlight and then it'll start to take off. This is what we've been planting the last few years, about $25 to $29 an acre um, seed cost. Um, we've got some ryegrass and clover, a bit, of, a bit of radish and a little bit of vetch. It seems that whatever, whatever happens will, um, I'm not sure why that ended up in there. Um, this stuff will kind of sit dormant in the bottom until it gets the sunlight, then it'll take off. Here's what it looks like just pre-harvest. So you see that uh, the clover's in there, that crimson clover and the ryegrass down below. Ah, now we can't advance. There we go. So this is just, you can almost see the combine at the far end. So just, this is just at harvest in that commercial cornfield. Um, you'll see that, that uh, the radishes are showing up really nice. Um, if you've got really heavy fodder and really the good corn crop, 
Sometimes you get areas where it doesn't establish well, it doesn't get enough sunlight, so everything's not perfect. We did have areas where we had some issues. Um, mostly that's because we weren't getting into the ground early enough that it got a head start before the rows closed in. Um, you always need to leave some areas where you, where you miss a spot, where you can't count rows or whatever. It always gives the neighbors lots to talk about. Um, this particular field, um, when we went into beans, the, um, this spring actually went into beans in that, um, you could pick out, this is what most of the field looked like. I'll come back to that, that slide in a second. Um, so after wheat harvest, we have other opportunities. Um, so we can grow all sorts of things because we've got that nice long window as soon as the wheat's harvested. So we've been putting radishes and a few other things. Um, we were trying to spread our manure on first and then get our cover crops planted. Uh, the problem was is we were losing valuable time. So now we've gone to the point where we're planting our cover crops and we're spreading manure on top. We're not seeing any damage to the crops even if we're putting liquid on top of them afterwards. So a bit of tramping where the spreader tires go, but we're not seeing a lot of damage. Sunflowers work well. Um, we need to get different types of roots into the ground to get uh, to break the soil up and uh, and offer different things, different environments for the microbes. Here's one that I'm really excited about. This one has worked worked better than I anticipated after wheat harvest. So sorghum sedan grass, we no tilled it in. We dumped some rye and turnips just on top afterwards. Here it is, September the 12th. Um, where, the, where the swath are sitting was just the rye and the turnips. Right beside that is the sorghum. Now those were planted at the same time. Here's seven weeks after planting, us cutting that sorghum. So tremendous amount of growth on there. Um, this, this past year we put some forage peas in there and that's giving us some really good quality forage. Um, we'll, we'll wrap that in uh, and round bale it. Seed costs about $16, $17 an acre. So by the time we get that cut and, and, and delivered back to the cows, I've got about $14 a bale into that. Um, we're getting six bales to the acre, so pretty decent yield coming off of that. Um, the analysis, I know you can't read that, but it is, it is pretty good, similar to late bloom alfalfa silage. And roots, tremendous. Um, the sorghum is a dry weather crop, so it likes it hot and dry. It'll put down a tremendous amount of roots, really good for building soil structure underneath. And the cows seem to eat it pretty good. We'll just uh, round bale that and feed that out into the, into the field as round bale to supplement some of their corn stalks. Good clean seed always. You get what you pay for. Um, being of Dutch ancestry, we, uh, we try to keep a, an eye on cost as much as we can. Um, so we're buying some discard seed, some bin run seed, et cetera. You get what you pay for, and we've, we've learned that lesson that we've got to be really careful of our seed sources. Chickweed is just uh, one of the things that comes automatically in our soil. This one here, you probably don't see that up here. Um, gypsum weed is deadly to cattle, and we've actually lost calves by them eating this stuff. So um, that does come into our ground, and we do get that from buying a seed that's not clean. Climate change. Of course, we're in the banana belt, right? So we're, we're good where we are, but sometimes we have this. Um, this is what most of the time, kind of what we expect for our winter. You've got this, um, the cows can find the corn stalks, we can graze that pretty good. We do get a bit of snow and, and what'll happen, we had a few times where, where the snow would melt and you have that layer of ice and the cows can almost walk on top and we figure we're gonna have to start hauling some feed out there. Um, cows are pretty resourceful, they'll, stomp on that crust, break it open, slide the snow aside with their nose and just help themselves to the feet underneath. They know it's there, um, so they get along there just another day. Of course, we do get some thaw out, some Chinooks that come through and, uh, and it will, uh, it'll thaw it out and that's kind of what it looks like. So you can, all, you can kind of see to the right where they've chewed it down and through the snow and where that cow's standing and, and to the left of it is, uh, is what's left that she didn't graze. So this is really nice if we can get this going into the winter. Um, so what did I learn? We need to really pay, a cost, pay attention to seed costs and availability. So we need to make sure that our seed's in place the day we want to plant because there's nothing worse than having everything ready to go and having to wait for a seed order to come from wherever because you decided you want to plant a certain, uh, certain cover crop. Um, 
We looked at moving the livestock and rotational grazing. We've since quit that. Um, rotational grazing works great on conventional pasture um, during the growing season. When we're grazing in the wintertime, whatever's there is there. And if we have a 100 acre chunk, the cows will go across and they'll help themselves to whatever's there. And we weren't seeing any benefits by rotational grazing it. So we'll just let them have the whole 100 or 200 acres, whatever's in the block. And uh, we don't worry about it. Um, all of our pastures do have access to some water. We find most of the time if we've got enough snow, um, we don't need to really be too concerned about it. Mud is another issue and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, shortly. So some things we, we don't do anymore. Uh, you might not want to want run your cows on winter wheat. It's okay if it's frozen or dry. Sometimes when it looks like that, it's, uh, it, it's going to be affecting your yield. So we, we do fence the winter wheat fields off, so keep the cows out. Um, it will survive and will grow, but it's just not the best. Alfalfa, you probably don't want to have your alfalfa field looking like that going into the spring. Um, when we were rotational grazing, we were concentrating our cattle into certain areas. So if it happened that it was wet or muddy during a certain time of the grazing season in the winter or spring, we were getting a lot of damage. We found that by giving them access to more ground, they didn't, they didn't concentrate the damage in certain areas and it seems to work better. We will no-till through that. Um, we were mostly no-till and conventional till. If we have an area that's really badly damaged, we will go and stir it up to level it off. Most times we'll no-till right through that without any issues at all. You get areas like this where they were fenced off a wheat stubble or wheat, uh, winter wheat ground and they will concentrate and do a fair bit of damage. Um, we will plant soybeans through that when it dries up. Um, we found that you would think that they've destroyed that, we're not going to get anything. Um, yield checks on that, we were one or two bushels less than the rest of the field on this piece of headland, so it was the width of the sprayer, so a 90 foot strip, along the, of course along the roads so everybody can see it. Um, and we did put soybeans, we were one or two bushels less per acre on that piece than we were in the rest of the field. Did we hurt it? I don't think so. The shape of the cow's hoof is, uh, is helping us. It's not damaging it. Plus the fact that we've been doing con cover crops and uh, no-till for so many years that the soils build up resistance. It's got uh, some um, texture to it. It's got some cover crops, some protection on top. So they're not, de they're not destroying the fields. Every normal year always has the same growing conditions, of course. Here we are, uh, the end of December in 2015. March of 2007, February 2009, March 2010, here we are St. Patrick's Day of 2012, lots of growth there, lots of feed. But what if you have a year like this? Here's the end of March, we've got next to nothing. We need our plan B. So some of the things we've done, this is oats that were planted on a neighbor's farm. We round baled those and, uh, and wrapped those. That made really nice green field, that was actually um, in January, we were bailing those up. Um, here's what was left for the neighbor. He was quite happy. He could no-till right into that, and we got a bunch of free feed out of it. That's what it looked like coming out of the bale. Uh, red clover stubble, so red clover into wheat, bale that up. Um, that makes good. We do need to pay attention to the, some mold in the, that stuff going into our cows, so we've since quit doing that. Uh, corn stover, we've got all kinds of it, neighbors that wish to get rid of it, and we can help them with that. So we do do a fair bit of, uh, of baling of corn stalks to help our neighbors out. It's free feed for us, and it, uh, it helps them uh, out. So free feed or bedding, whatever we need it for. Uh, we have dry, tried swath grazing, mixed results. At the end of the day, if the cow can graze it without us doing anything to it, we'll just leave it. So we, we don't swath graze at all anymore. Bale grazing works really well. We can put, if we need supplemental feed, we can drop bales out into the field as we need, and uh, the cows will clean those up. Sometimes there's a little bit left in there, but we can level that, spread that out with a front end loader if it's really bad, and we'll no-till right through that stuff. Corn stalks, they'll clean it up pretty good. Opportunity feeds, because we're down in the vegetable area, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of access to different vegetables. So this is, uh, actually this is discard out of the freezers. So it's frozen peas, um, there, oh, there's everything in there, some rice, beans, all sorts of things. So opportunity feeds, that's kind of what it looks like. It's not free feed because you always have 
things that you don't count on coming in there. So we will lose the odd cow to hardware. Um, all this stuff comes from a factory somewhere and we do get some uh, nails and, and you name it shows up in there. So we do need to be cautious of that. Cereal works really well if the price is right. You can, move, you can feed that. Here's rice and peas and beans, um, green beans, cauliflower, all this stuff coming out of the freezers as they clean it up. They need a spot to dump it and we provide them with a spot to dump it. Uh, we can blend that in and that uh, makes really nice cow feed. Um, we were getting this for quite a while. This comes from the grocery store, so anytime you have a head of lettuce with bad leaves on the outside or, or vegetables that no one wants to eat, we were getting about 12 ton a week of this stuff. Um, cows just love it. They'll eat anything, um, even the flowers. Um, you'll see there's pineapples in there and all sorts of things. Uh, coconuts, they have a little bit of trouble with. If you can break it open, they will eat the coconuts, but uh, yeah. Um, we do get a fair bit of carrots. Um, we'll bring in about uh, 300 semi-loads of carrots a year. Um, works really good for the cows. We have to be careful we don't get this into our finishing ration because it does turn the fat yellow. So, but for cows it works good. So we've actually done pile grazing with that. We'll dump semi-loads in the field, kick the cows out into the, into the field and they'll work on those piles pretty good and that'll get them through the winter. So looks kind of interesting in the field, gives the neighbors lots to talk about. Uh, we did seal pits, our pit silos with it. Works really nice on top of the silage. Put about six, six feet of, si of carrots on top. That'll squish down to a couple of feet. Uh, the downside with that is it sealed it really good. The crows couldn't get in it. Um, we didn't have to mess with plastic or anything. The downside is the carrot juice will run into about the first two feet of that silage. So we had to make sure the first two feet of that top of pit went to cows, not to our feedlot, because we were getting some yellow fat issues. So that were good. Um, we also try uh, distiller soluble solids. Um, that's what's on top of this. That works pretty good. It comes in a yellow liquid right from the uh, ethanol plant. Um, the bottom part of this is sweet corn silage. So this comes from the uh, sweet corn processing plants. So that's all the ears, the cobs, and the husks that comes from that, uh, that uh, harvesting process. Um, they run it through a chopper and drop it at our feedlot and we pack it and it makes pretty nice feed. Uh, it is wet, so we do have some juice, we do have some runoff that we have to deal with coming out of this. Um, but it makes nice feed and works really good for the cows and for the feedlot. Um, with the distillable solids on top, we don't have to worry about segregating that top part of the pit anymore. We can feed everything to the feedlot. Um, that's a, a close shot of that distiller solubles. Um, kind of like a, almost like a yellow pudding or a paste that goes on top. So we flip tradition right upside down. We've dealt with uh, quite a number of challenges. Um, we talked about the mud, variability. Ration balance is always a challenge. And we're, uh, because our feeding byproducts and co-products, you don't have a guaranteed supply coming in and your quality varies. Um, so we do get plastic in the feed, we do get a few other things. Um, we have to always have kind of a plan B so we can, uh, we can feed what we need to and mix it. We've done um, carrots and uh, barley straw works really nice in a ration um, and a few other things. Um, all our rotations and our grazing plan has to fit. So we like to have, if we can, for our fall calving cows, we like to have a field of wheat stubble nearby so we can kick those girls out so they can calve uh, in the fall on some wheat stubble. Uh, just makes our life a lot easier. Everything else, we're calving on these fields in April and May. We're pulling them off as we need to to plant the field um, and then working on it. Um, see, we've done, done a little bit of damage, but we're not, we're not seeing any yield drag and we are able to no-till right through all of that. So yes, we can. We've, we basically, we've extended our grazing season right to the full year. We've got unlimited forage choices, so if we can grow it, we can feed it. Um, with our vegetables in our rotation, gives us a unique advantage in that some of those are planted late or harvested early, so we do have some extra windows that we can fill in some, uh, some gaps. Um, the cover crop residue and, or the crop residue and the cover crop makes an excellent pair of, of crops to grow in that we can graze 
we can extend our grazing. If uh, one acre corn stalks will do one cow for one month, if we put a cover crop in there, we can gain an extra two weeks. So we're, get, we're getting six weeks of grazing per acre per cow on corn stalks with a cover crop in it. So at very little extra cost. We don't have to harvest or store any of our winter feed. We do need a plan B, but we don't have to re the bulk of it, the cows can harvest and everything on their own. They're healthier calving outside. We will calve out, um, I guess I didn't mention, my daughter and I are run the, cal run the calving part of the operation. So the two of us will calve out those 225 cows in the spring by ourselves. So we need healthy calves, we need easy calvers, we need them outside so they've got exercise. Um, we do have some permanent pasture, we run a few cows on our permanent pasture, but we only have 100 acres of it, so there's only a few cows that get out on that every year. So as we walk through some of the things we've done, that's what a turnip looks like after, it's, uh, after the frost and it's broken open. We've grazed across all different types of things. Even through the snow, through the winter, everything works, works good. This is nice. This is better. This is where we need to be, and this is where we're, we're coming to on our, on our commercial cornfields. Um, really nice amount of feed, good quality feed, and gets us through the winter. So this is really nice to see this going into our, going into our winter um, after sweet corn harvest. This is really good. All right, questions. So we're, we're going to have to have you take the microphone and ask the question just so that we get it up on the, on the camera. You working on? Uh, is it on? The, are you working on uh, heavy clay soil or lighter soil? So we work on a very variation of soil. We have some heavy clay, and we have some light sand, and we're able to make it work on on all our soil types. Um, we were we were concerned about the heavy clay that we were doing some damage, but we're not seeing any yield drag in the heavier clay soils. You find with a no-till drill, you need a Kohler Caddy or is one without a uh, right? It depends on the year and how patient you are. Most times we can get through with just the, just the no-till drill. We've got a 750 drill and we're able to go through with just with the drill. Um, we will, you will see some pugs where the, where the feet are, um, but we're able to, it seems to work just fine. We actually did a road planter um, last spring we were running behind. So we had the row planter on one side of the farm and the drill on the other side, and we couldn't, you know, our, our beans went uh, 63 bushels out of there. Um, we had no problem um, with the row planter through that. Yeah. But, the, but we've done years and years of cover crops, and our soil's mellow, and it, you don't get the big hard lumps. It, it mellows itself out. More, uh, more questions? <laughs> we got Ken at the back here. I got one here first, and now oh, the back there we go. If you're pasturing uh, or baling oats, like in what March you said, mm -hmm. do you, what happens to the feed value when they're dormant and dried out? Like so that? we'll we'll graze them in March. We, if we're going to bale them for stored feed, we'll bale them in the fall. Yeah. So actually, our sorghum we've been baling that in uh, late summer. With sorghum, we have to be really careful because if we if we get a frost and you try to feed that right away, you'll get some prussic acid issues. So we want to make sure that we catch that sorghum before it gets a frost on it. Um, we also want to make sure that we don't run cows on that till after about a week or 10 days after it's frozen. Mike, uh, <clears throat> Mike, can you go over the... Can you go over the weaning process for your calves, how you get them off the grass, and at what stage they, they come into the feedlot? Okay, so, so what we're doing with our calves is we've gone to, uh, we pre-vaccinate, so, so we run everybody through, vaccinate, back with the cows, and then when we're ready to wean, we'll put the weaning flaps in, and we started doing that a number of years ago. Um, yes, it's an extra trip through the chute, but we're finding it really significantly reduces the stress. Um, because our retail is a natural program, we don't want to use antibiotics if we don't absolutely have to. Um, so by reducing the stress with the vaccinating early and the weaning flaps, um, we've virtually eliminated our shipping fever coming into the feedlot. Um, so we'll pull those calves and 
we'll, so let me back up a second. So we'll run them through the chute, we'll put the flaps in, they go back with the mama cow for about five days, then we'll pull the calves out and leave the cows where they're at. Um, that virtually eliminates the bawling. Um, actually, the cows will make a little more noise than the calves do now. Um, the calves don't wander all around the feedlot pens looking for their way out. Um, they're more relaxed, they're more settled. Um, we try to get them on to feed before we wean. So um, a lot, because we're dry lawning a bunch of these cows in the summer, so our, our uh, spring calvers, the, those, those will be in a dry lot for the summer. So they're used to seeing a bit of corn silage and a bit of uh, carrots, so they're already on feed. So when we drop them into the feedlot, that eliminates that, uh, that transition as well. Um, so we're weaning about uh, end of November, 1st of December, our spring calvers. Other question? Mike, uh, could you comment on some of the working arrangements you have with your neighbors? And I'm guessing that's been a bit of a, a process. <laughs> as well, could you comment on some of your... Uh, uh, lessons learned on fencing. Maybe you have some suggestions on what does work or doesn't work with some of the somewhat temporary fencing, I guess, in some ways. Right. So um, our neighbors, so this is the first year we've grazed a neighbor's cornfield, so, which is why we don't have the fence set up there yet. Um, so the arrangement we have with him is kind of unique. Um, we're going to graze his corn stalks and stuff then we're going to, we didn't supply him any seed or anything this year. Um, so our arrangement is next year we will supply him with cover crop seed and if he wants us to plant it, we'll plant it. That, that gives us two benefits. That gives us control of what we're going to have in that field and it's no expense to him to plant, to establish a cover crop. So he gets the, the, the root benefits and all the benefits of the cover crop um, without any expense. We go through, we'll take the stalks off with the cows, We'll drop some manure back, so it's a win-win situation for all of us. Um, because he's directly adjacent to one of our fence rows, we can run, those cows can come up to their regular water bowl for water, so we don't need to worry about a water source over there. We can hook the electric wires onto our fences and it, it should work out pretty good, theoretically. Um, the downside is, down in our area, as you know, there is no boundary fences anywhere. So if these, if these cows get out there, they're wandering till they decide to go somewhere else. Um, so what we will run is two hot wires on the outside. Um, I'm hoping that we've got quiet enough cows that we can get away with that. Um, calves in the spring, we do have a bit of issue. Uh, Mama will push that cow in underneath the fence um, if there's long grass there just to give her a bit of protection, which is okay unless it's right beside, unless it's in the ditch by the road. So we do run into a few issues with those girls, uh, those calves sneaking out there. Um, so we try to keep that hot wire just a little bit lower in the fields that we're going to be calving in. Um, but as long as we got a good snap on it, we've been, we've been getting along good with just one hot wire and a couple of uh, dummy wires on the top um, around most of those. Yep. I didn't hear any mention of... I didn't hear any mention of uh, <clears throat> mineral or salt out there in the wintertime or I wasn't real clear on how you get water to those cows out there in the wintertime. Yep. So, so we, all of our pastures, all of our paddocks have access to a water bowl at a barn or a house or something. We do have water bowls set up. We find that if we have a lot of snow, they don't, uh, they don't tend to come up for the water. If there's melt water, they're, they're quite content drinking the melted snow water. Um, minerals, because we're running a number of different herds and uh, we needed, to, we needed a, a system to make sure that we got minerals where we needed. So, we, so we've gone to what we call Mineral Monday. So every Monday, each, each group gets their, gets their free choice mineral. Um, that, way we didn't, that way we don't miss any groups and that way we're sure they have constant mineral all the time. So depending on the size of the group, whether they get one bag or two, but the Mineral Monday thing has worked really well, especially when we have part-time help or whatnot, um, doing some chores, et cetera. That way we get, we get that job taken care of. Yep. More questions? Anyone? Mike, when you're calving out on pasture in the spring and the fall, do you, <clears throat> they can, if you have problems, 
up to the barn, or do you have a uh, like a setup that you can get them in and work with, or what do you do? So a few years ago, we got one of those. We call it a shark cage that hooks onto the side by side. Oh, yeah. And that works really well for the for the yep. cows that are gonna kill you. A part of the challenge with, if you go if you go into a, a more natural environment, like I call it, so these cows will be in the back of a 100 acre farm, they're calving, um, we have coyotes around. Um, because we're in more of an urban area, nobody, hardly anybody hunts them. So we have a, a real issue with the coyotes that, that clean up the odd calf. Um, so mama cow is a lot more protective when she's out in that natural environment. Right. So we do need to be, the shark cage really helps us. Um, we have a portable, uh, a portable crowding tub and, uh, and chute system that we can haul out there if we need to. Nine times out of 10, because we're, um, because the cows are well exercised, they're not shut up in a barn, so they've got lots of good exercise and calving ease bulls. Yeah. Um, we, we pulled um, two calves last year, and that's because they were heifers, and we had fed, we had, our fault, we fed the heifers too much, oh, yeah. so the heifers were fat, but we never pull calves. So you have very few dystocia problems because of the exercise, like they're always yes. walking. I've heard that yep. before. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's good. Yep. Any other questions? We also don't, we also don't check them uh, often either. So we're not, we're not one, you know, we don't have enough staff to check them through the night. So we check them twice a day. If we're concerned, we'll check them three times a day. Yep. But most times, we'll check them in the morning, check them at night, and uh, and we have very very little problems with them. They calve on their own. We like to we like to catch them as soon as they calf, um, tag them, castrate them. Yeah. Um, because we're out in a clean environment, we don't need to worry about navel infections. We don't need to worry about a lot of that other the other issues. We don't need to worry as much about mothering. Um, mama cow will go off in her corner, she'll have her calf when she's ready to join the herd, she'll come up with it. Um, the odd time, because we're a big space, we run into a little issue with twins. Right. So she'll forget she has a twin, or she'll have one over there and one over there. So the odd time, we will, we will have issues with twins. So we'll pull uh, mama cow with her twins, run them up into a smaller yard until they get mothered, mothered up, and then we'll put them back out. That might be when you run into coyote problems. If you don't exactly, find twin. exactly. Yep, the one we lost last spring, she took one twin and the coyote yep. got the other one. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And with your consumer retail business and <coughs> with the cows outside, do you have any consumers with any crazy questions like, <laughs> geez, it must be freezing out there. Don't you feel bad for them? How, how, how awful uh, are you guys? Yeah. Well, because because we're, where we are, we're right on the 401 and Bloomfield Road, so two major roads. Um, it, it's like farming in a fishbowl. Everybody sees what you're doing all the time. So when we first started running cows outside, you listen to the radio and they say, you've got to put your pet in the house for the day. Um, we, you know, we don't have room in the living room for all the cows, so we have to leave some of them outside. Um, we were getting the Humane Society visiting on a weekly basis when we first started running them outside. Um, but it was, you know, it was mixed, you know, mixed feelings because I got to know the inspector really well and I got, a, I got the opportunity to educate him on hide, coat, hide hair co coat, um, water, um, wind breaks, all the things that these cows needed. And by the time we were done, he had a very good knowledge about raising cows outside and how good it was for them. And uh, he just, it was to the point where he'd, he'd show up in the morning and park in the driveway. He had to fill out his paperwork and he said, oh, I'm just here filling out my paperwork again. Um, he had to come because he had a complaint, but um, the calls have slowed down quite a bit. We don't get quite as many, but uh, yeah, people see everything. And if you have something with a sore foot or, or heaven forbid, something that drops dead on you in the, in the field, everybody knows about it. Yeah. So we try, to, we try to keep that cleaned up as quickly as possible. Yeah. Mike, you mentioned about windbreaks. Do you have portable windbreaks or do you have portable windbreaks or do you set some up with some big square bales? Or? Uh, so, so a number of our fields will have um, cedar windbreaks, like cedar row trees. Um, if we don't have good wind breaks or if we don't have them in the right spot, like we were talking this morning about the south winds. Yeah. So we've got a few fields where they don't have wind breaks on all four sides. We'll run a row of straw bales up in the field 
and then just run a hot wire beside it because otherwise there'll be a pile of mush. But um, yeah, so we'll, we'll run windbreaks where we need to. Uh, we don't have any, any uh, portable windbreaks, but we do use the straw bales and that works pretty good. Yeah. Any other questions? Good job, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that was very knowledgeable and uh, a different outlook on the way we uh, normally calve. So if you take a few of those hints and take them home and uh, make use of them, you hopefully can make a little more money. So up next, we have uh, farm safety videos, grain augers, tractor safety. I assume no one's coming. We're just going to put on a video. And just for your perusing uh, pleasure, we're going to put them up, and then we're going to have a break after that. So... In case I forget, when we do go to break after this video, if you pick up a coffee, if we have actual uh, coffee mugs or whatever, please take all your garbage and mugs back and set it back in the refreshment area. It just uh, seems to help clean up. The ladies come and uh, take them away periodically. So if you like actually drinking coffee out of a coffee mug and not a styrofoam container, please take your mugs back. So now we get a video. Augers are one of the pieces of farm equipment that per hour of use are perhaps one of the most dangerous pieces of equipment because of their design to reach up onto grain bins at great heights, their active moving components in terms of the auger and the flight involved in drawing the grain up, and the hydraulic components and winches used to drive the auger itself. When we look at augers today, what we're finding is there's been great improvement both in the manufacturing and the shielding and guarding, the engineering of augers. People are being uh, much more careful. They're making sure that they're shutting down the machine when they're working on it. Uh, we also have a situation where people are uh, uh, being trained much better, and they're much more aware of the potential dangers out there when they're working in and around augers. Power augers in any bins can be a dangerous piece of equipment if not used properly. Uh, one of the ways that we uh, ensure safety is uh, by having lockouts on the power source at the bin doors. That way when uh, personnel have to go in to work on these augers that the power can be locked out and uh, tagged that somebody is in those bins. One of these mechanisms here is uh, a lockout on the auger engagement or inside the bin, that way that sweep auger inside the bin won't, cannot be started. This ring is uh, connected to a mechanism inside the bin that stops the auger at a point here that will not allow that auger to carry on any further, it will stop its motion. Additionally, inside the bin there's uh, safety grates covering the holes. This way uh, you can't get your foot caught in the holes or into the auger. Uh, here at the Barkay Ranch, we've uh, gotten away from using augers for a lot of our, our transfer of feed and, and fertilizer, uh, mainly because of the inherent problems with uh, augers, the problems with cold weather start, and, and, uh, and then the, uh, 
uh, by not using augers, we don't have problems with uh, people getting caught uh, in the augers. So we, we developed rather a simple system here that could be adapted to almost any place. All, we, all you need is a bank, and uh, the sides could be made out of timbers, or in this case, we use steel. The trucks drive over top and dump into uh, the, the bottom part here, and, and we just come in with a loader. Uh, we use a, a cat loader, but could be a tractor with a loader and uh, move the product that way. The operator never has to get out of the machine and the loader in transferring the stuff. I really like this system because it not only makes uh, transfer of product more efficient, but uh, uh, we're reducing the hazard by having somebody get caught in augers and uh, it keeps the employees happier because they're not uh, messing around in the cold with uh, machinery that doesn't always start easy. It's part of our safety plan here, and it's a simple, uh, easy system to put in place. Rollover protective structures, or more commonly referred to as ROPs, are present on all tractors that are manufactured after 1985. If we uh, look at the situation with rollover protection in agriculture, over the last uh, 30 years we've seen a tremendous increase in safety awareness. Farmers are wearing their seatbelt more often. We find farmers are wearing seat belts on the roadway where there's a potential for collision and the tractors and equipment leaving the road, going into ditches and so on. We find that farmers are wearing their seat belts in conjunction with the rollover protection when they're working fields where there are extremely high hills, uh, where ground or terrain is very rough, or also where they may be working near ditches and, and embankments. What's important to recognize is that in Manitoba and in the prairies, we often perceive them as being flat and without hazards and question whether we really require to have a roll bar on the tractor and put our seat belt on. If you're working on a roadside, if there are depressions on your field or any obstacles that are present that are going to tilt your tractor more than about 25 degrees, the potential of a tractor rollover is very real and very present. So having a rollover protective structure erupts on your tractor and using the seat belt can make the difference between life and death. You can never take anything for granted on a machine like this, of this size, of its caliper. It needs to be maintained and properly operated as well. An operator needs to have his mind on what is going on, has to have his ears tuned to the machine. That comes with experience. Any strange sounds or strange actions can mean that there's something wrong with the machine. That needs to be properly inspected and fixed promptly. One of the, the major problems with bunker silos is that with single walls, uh, when farmers pack their piles, they could get too close to the edge and they could slip right off and roll the tractor and get a severe injury. We have tried to prevent that by making two walls and uh, a berm, either a dirt berm or a gravel berm, so that when you slide down, you get caught by the dirt berm and then you can just be pulled back in safely. <laughs> 